This is Cow the Podcast. Yeah, hi there and welcome to Cow the Podcast. This episode, Inside the Brain Hack. Uh, my intent this week is more, more on, more about being mindful of who we are, about making an effort to become the observer so that our lives don't lead us blindly straight over the cliff. More about how we do have free will and how we can make decisions that will change our lives and change the world. I think there's information out there starting to make sense. It's beginning to hit the mainstream and it has huge implications for how we do things and how we think. We need to be aware of it. This week, I'm taking another look at the role of narrative in general and at our cultural myths, how narrative works for us, but also how it works on us. What is it, narrative? Where do we get it? Where does it come from? And you'll know maybe if you are a regular listener that what I'm doing here is essentially recording my own personal journey of philosophical discovery, putting it out there. And at the heart of this is the idea something isn't quite right. And this is the search for finding what that thing is. Comments much appreciated. If you're finding the episodes of any value and you'd like to help, you'll find details of how to do just that at cowthepodcast.online. So back to today, what's the key to this? To me, it's as though the narrative that we share is like a map. It's guiding us like an inbuilt GPS. And we have to have a map of some sort, but, and this is the main point, our map is only programmed for the motorways. Yes, that's great. We're all going the same way on it. So we're overtaking, swapping lanes, breaking down, getting stuck in daily traffic jams. And the accidents are few and far between. It's all pretty safe. The problem is that maybe only a few miles down the road, round the next bend, we can't see it, but the bridge is out. Maybe they haven't even built it yet. So more about this narrative landscape that we inhabit through the smoke and mirrors of our monkey brains, the importance of that landscape to society, to social cohesion, and to our shared memes and culture. And how we as individuals respond to it and how it responds to us. How our narratives, our myths to us, are like a dam is to a beaver. You can't have one without the other. These myths are a living part of our biome. The trick is to understand how these major narratives work. And over the weeks I've been drawn into the power of an evolutionary analysis and the place of neurological factors, and the idea that social organisms evolve, they have their own lives. Like artists talk of their creations being let free into the world, cultural units, memes, at the same time are influenced and guided in an extended feedback loop, ultimately by the individual. According to Dan Dennett, in this cultural or societal narrative, an epigenetic narrative, genes are not the DNA. Genes are the information carried by the DNA. Once you get this, then you understand a meme. The meme, the DNA of a meme, then becomes language or communication in any other form, signs, myths, behaviours. The potency of language as a medium for the transmission of information can't be denied. And neither, therefore, can its similarity to genes. Like C, G, T and A for the different DNA nucleotides, language is also composed of simple elements. And these are the basic sounds of language, known as phonemes. We're able to instantly recognise and decode these combinations of these sounds in highly sophisticated ways so that we can transfer information, even without understanding what it means. According to Dawkins, a meme is an element of a culture or system of behaviour that is passed from one individual to another by imitation or by some other non-genetic means. Human culture is composed at least in part of elements or units that are like genes copied and replicated, mutating and evolving and thereby creating and maintaining the cultural structures and themes that we're familiar with. They are metaphors laid layer upon layer upon reality. Very real. Ways of dealing with social cohesion, of managing belief, and evolving. And with language, we copy the sequence of phonemes, 
passing on cultural significance like automata, like the minute machines we can see transporting proteins around at the genetic level, never truly conscious, never conscious of the meaning we're perpetuating, like a cold virus, for example. A cold virus isn't for anything other than creating more copies of the cold virus. Same for a meme. And we can draw that parallel with the memes, or at least the early memes, as being more like a virus infecting community through replication or behavioural habits. But then as the memes come to represent better ways of doing things, they come to dominate. This is a process with very many parallels across behaviours. But it needn't be conscious. It's more a subconscious falling into place, more of an evolutionary inevitability emerging as a byproduct of an irresistible march towards chaos and surviving. Survival being an inevitable consequence of statistics. Perhaps a culture developed hand washing. Living by a flowing stream, they always wash their hands and wash their food. And they thrived whilst their neighbours, having no stream, kept dying of infection. Now you can see memes beginning to select for fitness. And the roots of culture or society can be seen emerging. As words within language have been selected for fitness and go extinct, as they do, so culture and society is composed of units like the individual words, which have histories, lineage, kin, and an ability to adapt or to combine, and the result is a creative melting pot within which ideas and benefits evolve for the good of all, for the community, for society, and this all without the need for the knowledge of the individual. The power of the meme is to speak for itself in terms of fitness and advantage and in partnership with the biome, like the beaver's dam. And this culture, as I've said, is transmitted through language and meme, not with a detailed evolutionary analysis, but through myth and landscape. The trick is in trying to step out of the existing narrative, to stand calmly on the hillside, to view the landscape as a viewer, conscious and purposeful. Consider religion versus science or material versus the ideal, determinism versus free will. Who's in charge of this? Who's making all these decisions? I came across an interview with a guy named Yuval Noah Harari. He's an Israeli historian, professor of history, uh, done a number of TED Talks, and is a best-selling author. Uh, the interview I'm thinking of was on his book, Sapiens. It blew me away, so I'm going to pass it on to you here, and let me know what you think. He says, we developed cognitive abilities 70,000 years ago. This is just, in evolutionary history, a moment ago, a click of the fingers, a blink of an eye. And 70,000 years ago, we were just another mammal, but we became the most powerful mammal there has ever been. We got to the top table, the top of the food chain, just like tigers or sharks, but in record time. Now, sharks and tigers exist in harmony with their own ecosystems. In symbiosis, they've evolved with checks and balances in place. They have evolved slowly. We, 70,000 years ago, developed from being a prey animal, suddenly into gods, homo sapiens, manipulating nature, bending it to our wishes, able to shape the environment that supported us. And what did we do? We did it with communication networks, trading empires, cultures, societies and technology, creating our own ecosystems. We thrived, but we destroyed too. 50,000 years ago, Homo sapiens arrived in Australia. Some few thousand years later, 90% of the larger animals were extinct. 15,000 years ago, Homo sapiens crossed the Bering Straits and made their way south through America, through Canada, America. 70% of the larger animals were extinct on that continent within 2,000 years. The process continues, and the animals that survive today only do so because we have decided they will. We don't understand how to wield this power. We are like children in shock. A sheep with nuclear weapons. This is worse than wolves, because we're afraid. Now, with this cognitive revolution came larger social organisation, more complex structure, more powerful societies, able through cooperation to move mountains, to thrive. And Harari argues that this organisation is held together by myth. We don't know the fact. 
It's possible we never will. But in order to survive, we have a layer of interpretation, of construction, of made-up stuff that we can all share. Everyone is on the same page telling the same story again and again and again to their children and their children's children. And this is a necessity. We have to believe, because without belief, the group will disintegrate. In a free and liberal culture like the UK, yes, we may have differences. Brexit, for example, but at least we will agree on some basic myths. Humanism, human rights, capitalism and the economy. And it's not that, that an Illuminati have held a meeting to structure these myths and thereby take control of the sheep. The myths arise out of true belief. The priest and the banker believes his stories and they get passed on and we believe them. What is interesting in the terms of Homo sapiens is the ability we have to hold separate and often contradictory beliefs in place and that we can believe them all at the same time. Yes, one will take precedence, and this is key. We are able to drop one for another in an instant to recast ourselves in a new fiction or role as and when required. It's the niche of Homo sapiens to be able to create and inhabit different niches quickly and much quicker than any genetic adaption would allow. We have an adaptive culture in which any myth can be replaced in the blink of an eye and we can rewrite our own myth. Think, for example, Germany in the 20th century. Think Second Reich, Weimar Republic, the Nazi regime, the communist East, and then a liberal democracy. This is the same people with the same DNA, the same real beliefs, and in less than a hundred years, completely forgetting their past and switching over and over again. Maybe you're able to do this. Maybe we all are the ability to switch between different narratives and to shut down the alternatives. See how fundamental this myth is to human being. And how they work, according to Harari, is that the myths invoke group belonging and cohesion. But there's no doubt that myths also divide. Think politicians. In order to create group identity, where there needs to be an outsider, a stranger. Maybe the myth that the politician brings us is that they work to bring people together. But even Osama bin Laden had nothing against the US dollar. And money, perhaps. Is the most successful story that has ever been told. It's interesting to see how our brains behave in the presence of authority. Monitoring the brains of an American Baptist congregation, listening to their preacher, provided perhaps a surprise in that the prefrontal cortex shut down. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for critical thinking, for conscious observation. It shuts down. Theory has it that we are hardwired to accept authority and charisma, to accept all this narrative as truth. As we know, there's no reason for us to be specially selected to know reality. We've not evolved for the truth or from the truth. We have our smoke and mirrors, our tricks and go-tos, just as the jewel beetle does. Social signalling, clothing, consumption. These tell the tale of the stories we believe in. Our narrative experience is deeply rooted, and so it must be. We express it without thought. We accept it without thought, and this is a necessity for our survival. Large social organisations require shared narratives. If we couldn't shut down the prefrontal cortex, how would it work? And so to elites, to mythical groups, not necessarily mythical in existence, but held in position by myth, if the fact was that 400 years ago my grandfather had a horse or a sword and he stole the land from your grandfather, what would stop you from taking it back right now? Because my grandfather had a horse and was a warlord, is that an acceptable excuse? You bring me my taxes, sell me your children for that reason? Or perhaps if we have devised a myth of racial superiority, the will of God, a caste system, uh, economic prowess perhaps that would be easier and then to gender priority of men over women this is a worldwide narrative and why so stable well it's not an accident and it happens everywhere but 
Are men stronger? Well, maybe. But social power is the result of social skills. Pope Francis didn't get there by beating up the other cardinals. And women's social skills could be better than men's. Perhaps the narrative exists because of a need for childcare. In bonobos and in elephants, there are matriarchal organised groups that work together to raise the young. The males are shunned, so why is this not the case amongst human beings? Well, it may be the case, but perhaps the social skill of women is limited to personal networks and men are better equipped to deal with the alienation of large corporate myth. Which I guess brings us back to money. Even whilst we witness huge financial crisis, we believe in money. We're not prepared to give this myth up. The Fed created a trillion dollars to hold the banks up. Three billion dollars every day out of nothing. They just typed noughts into a computer. And we all believed it. There's no doubt money's made of trust and faith. And the narrative that goes with it, though, is key to all of our problems. Economic growth. Whatever you want, you name it. Is it freedom, democracy, equality, equity, jobs, peace? Well, we believe, or our narrative tells us, that you can only get that with economic growth. And at the personal level, if you have any problem, all you need to do is buy something to fix it. The myth of the consumer. A product, a service, a car, yoga, marriage guidance, whatever you need. At the collective level, we have economic growth. At the personal level, we just buy more stuff and we get happiness. But the stakes are high. If we stop believing in these stories, for example, the capitalist system will collapse. Then we have religion with all of the self-contained cognitive dissonance, conflicting beliefs and behaviours. What will religions look like in a hundred years time? Well, maybe techno religions will form out of Silicon Valley. But looking back, we can see how a moral narrative formed out of a lack of religious relevance. In the 19th century, the most violent behaviours came out of fundamentalism. This was in protest against the Industrial Revolution. See, out of Taiping and the Heavenly Kingdom, it was socialism that emerged. The relevance of the fundamental religious narratives had nothing to say about the situation and socialism took up the cause, changing our lives completely, allowing us a narrative switch. When we look back, we don't even remember an age of faith. We remember the technologies and the social upheaval. The main agents of change are different now, of course. The main products of the future will be in technology and in biology. There'll be parts of bodies and brains and minds. The Bible and the Quran will have nothing to say to those that will have no work and to those who will and who are already becoming irrelevant. And while science brings us new technologies, science does not provide any ethical answers to the problems that we face. It needs to employ allies for that. That science and religion are locked in a mortal battle for our souls and that it is hoped one day science will prevail and provide truth over the darkness. More myth. Science is truly about power rather than truth. Yes, individuals involved in the scientific project might be interested in truth per se, but the scientific project must form an alliance with some or other ideology or religion in order to tell us how to interpret it. And yes, some theories, scientific theories, conflict with the guiding religions, but in the main, science provides the power Religion tells us what to do with it. We recognise these narratives, these myths that Harari explains are so important for social cohesion and we identify with them. We become so wrapped up in them that we become fused with them in the cognitive fusion of our monkey brains. They do, after all, represent the culture we are immersed in, the story of money, Christianity or religion, of science of the state and of authority. They are our truths. We forget they've been made up and they become absolutes, appearing self-evident. And this we need, this necessity in itself for a shared myth becomes an extension of the culture. We want to belong. We want others to belong. We become immersed in the narrative and we police the immersion of others with rewards and punishments, social acceptance or banishment. It means that we don't question any of it. That lack of a will to question 
even leads to the fact that we don't even want to hear about it. This runs contrary to our own myth of of being free and self-determined individuals capable out of brilliance or worthiness or out of divine inspiration of creating whatever we will out of a pure strength of will capable of actions that for their innate goodness will be rewarded. Yes, we can do amazing things, but they spring out of our culture. The knowledge required for technological advance, for example, is not passed down through your genes as a lone competitive example of humanity. It's acquired from the ambient environment and it requires perception, our perceptions, which are at once capable of forming and being formed by our beliefs. This boils down to if we change our beliefs, we can change our behaviour. The number one question has to be, what is reality? What is really happening? And this requires concentration, focus and learning to be the observer. Through meditation, perhaps, we can practice the ability to be able to tell the difference between the stories that the mind keeps generating about the world, about ourselves, about everything and the actual reality. This is about the primacy of story or narrative in the way that we tell ourselves tales that don't quite describe the reality, that don't quite map onto what is really happening. And that these rules or conventions are useful, without them we have no society, we have no trade, but they are useful only insofar as they serve us. There's no use when we begin to serve them, or are forced perhaps to defend them, to fight over them, to kill and to crash and to burn blindly in a race to destruction. We need to know, to be aware that God, nation, money are all made up. The story of the West or the story of capital, yes, vastly successful. It's been a good story, but we need to be conscious that it was a story that evolved in the past. And as part of that story, we have to be able to see it for what it is, not to fight for it blindly, not to blindly accept it. We must adapt, we must take what serves us, discard that which doesn't. So I said we need to adapt. Well, I hope that we might agree on that. With new technologies now that bring into question even our fundamental narratives of freedom and free will. It's not good enough to expect to follow your heart when your heart can be manipulated by a supercomputer. That's the reality of now. We need to begin to ask what humans really need to understand how we really function and what we are truly basing our thoughts and structures on. And to start with, we might begin to recognise these stories for what they are. Understand the difference between fact and fiction, dogma and discourse. We must not be swayed from being able to discuss and explore these truths, however uncomfortable they might be. No issue must be sacred. Even the issue of human rights or of liberal democracy or economics or religion. If only to prove ourselves worthy of a fair and just outcome in the coming century there's no more than simply apt and a product of the past at the heart of this is my own personal need to remap my own personal cognitive landscape to take a look at some of the side roads stop off at a lake maybe do a bit of fishing and there's no doubt i guess that if i knew where all of these roads were leading if i had all the answers right here I might be putting this in a book, beautifully structured, laid out step by step. But this is more truly about the research, the journey, following the questions as they arise. It's an expanding landscape where sometimes we set out to find the coast, eyes firmly fixed on the horizon, and other times we meander around to fill in some of the detail, maybe the river delta or the city streets, contours of a cave at the beach. We wander the forests, or maybe head up on top of the mountain to get some orientation to get our bearings, find the source of the river. I could go on, but uh, you should have the point by now. Look, I know I get swayed one way or another on many of the questions this week. I'm a materialist. There's no doubt where I'm actually standing. Last week I was an idealist. And there are shifting sands to navigate in the grand narratives we may come across. But underlying this, I've come to understand even then that there's a danger, a desire to become taken in by it all to lose the view from the mountain and get caught in the mud. The same is done with politics, religion, social structures, the state. 
A similar phenomenon emerging in politics, for example, once the dividing line drawn between left and right made an easy distinction. Maybe it's just me, but as we become less immersed in traditional divides, as we step away from them and become the observer, this left-right distinction becomes more and more blurred. Yes, authoritarianism and totalitarianism, an erosion of liberty, things we all care about. But it becomes clear that this kind of state violence is rife from both political wings. There's often an absolutism implied in the way we are presented with philosophical arguments, everyday issues even, that either one or another viewpoint must be right. We can easily become seduced by our own biases and weaknesses, our need to belong and to be protected. And we define our realities through left and right, black and white opposites, through contrast and difference. And we forget that this in itself is just yet another myth, another narrative. I'm not denying that we need to have a certain degree of moral certainty, but many times when the conversation is hijacked by the monkey brain, it seems that really what we have is a battle raging for power, for control of opinion, control of the narrative, and any moral judgment is simply clouded by it. Is it not possible we might be asking the wrong question? We have to step back. We have to peel back the layers. Okay, I'm leaving it there. I've been Ant Biggs. You've been listening to Cow the Podcast. You'll find us at cowthepodcast.online or, of course, your favourite podcasting app. Look forward to talking to you next week. Mm-hmm.